Coming to you from DevNexus 2020 in Atlanta, Georgia, I'm Bob Rubert with the Oracle Groundbreakers team, and my guest is Chris Richardson. Chris, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm, I'm excited to be here, and I'm excited to be chatting with you once again. It's always a pleasure. Tell the folks at home what you do and where you do it. Oh, in a nutshell, I do microservices. Um, so I do a, two things. One is I travel around the world helping clients adopt the microservice architecture through a mixture of consulting and training. And then I also have a startup and we're creating a platform to simplify the development of business applications that is transactional in nature um, that use the microservice architecture. You've been involved in microservices for quite some time. Over the last, say, two or three years, how has that evolved? What's different now? I think, number one, the, the adoption is growing. You know, I'm keeping pretty busy. I think I, I travel, hit a new record for travel last year. Yet at the same time, you're sort of starting to see the, I don't know, I say backlash? Like every so often on Twitter, someone will go, monoliths of the future. And then that will get a gazillion likes and retweets, very high level of engagement, which is just, which is just frustrating to see. Because <laughs> it's sort of like, you know, neither monoliths or, nor microservices are the future. You know, they're essentially patterns and your job as an architect is to understand the context within which you're working the problems that you have to so that you need to solve and then pick the appropriate architecture so so chasing the shiny new thing is wrong but sticking with the old thing can equally be wrong as well it's like a stopped clock right there's it's sort of like it, yes yes now, I assume that microservices play some role in the presentation you're doing here at this event. Can you kind of encapsulate that session? Oh, yeah. Um, so basically, my talk is about how you can break up your monolith into services. You know, most people I talk to are not doing greenfield development. They, they already have a mission-critical you know, business application that they need to de develop faster, you know, deliver much more frequently reli and reliably. And so they need to migrate that to the microservice architecture. So I'm talking about the patterns that they can use to do that. In uh, several weeks, we will celebrate, the world will celebrate the 25th anniversary of Java. What does that mean to you? Tell me about how Chris Richardson's career intersects with Java's history. Well, my immediate thought is, God, I'm old. <laughs> so I, I can remember going to sort of like one of the Java launch events at Sun in the, I think it was a Cirque du Soleil tent. God, no, you know, when, when was I? I suppose 26 years, well, 1996, right? I think yeah. was that, was that when it came out? Um, so though I actually didn't use Java for a couple of years at least, I think. I've sort of lost track of time. What the heck? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, it was like I didn't use it for a while because it was not that mature. But then, oh my god, I've been using it for a really, really long time. <laughs> Java's been around for 25 years and so much has happened it just in terms of innovation and technological advancement over 25 years. What was Java's role in that? Now, you know, a few different thoughts. Um, you know, like I look at computer hardware. Right. So on the one hand, oh my God, that, that's like improved drastically, right? Like, I mean, one of the first computers I used had 32K of memory and ran at a megahertz at clock speed versus my laptop that probably, I think it has 32 gig and it runs at three gigahertz, right? So there's that element of things. But on the other hand, how we develop software, it's kind of like we sit at our, t uh, at our computers and we muddle along and the one thing that's and our productivity hasn't improved in the same exponential way as it has hardware except for the fact that there's Google and Stack Overflow so if we get stuck we can always look things up um, anyway that, that's just sort of off on a side rant you know in terms of actual technology I mean Java was hugely influential because you look at what the mainstream of computing was back in the 90s it was C yeah. Right, which is barely any better than assembler. And so it actually brought 
state, Java successfully brought state-of-the-art concepts from, you know, in, made them mainstream, specifically garbage collection. Um, so that, that was clearly huge. And then over the years, sort of Java has gradually improved. I mean, I felt like maybe 10 years ago, it wasn't really improving much as a language, but then Java 8 came along with lambdas. I forget when they came. I can't remember anything about it. It's so long ago. <laughs> You're but, <doing> fine. <laughs> yeah, but that, but that kind of like, you know, brought Java into the functional era. So on the one hand, it's not the most sophisticated, it's not the most expressive language, but I, I certainly found for, you know, lambdas made it good enough. And, and the improvements continue. I mean, personally, I would, yeah, I, I would like to see significant, many more significant improvements in languages because I, I look back over the course of my career and there hasn't been that overall, given that I started using programming in common list, the languages have not improved that much. Yeah, a fair bit, but not as much as you would expect and certainly not when you compare it with hardware. But, but it's... I don't know, Java's still here. It's not dead yet. <laughs> An optimist. Yeah. Uh, any new books on the horizon? Oh, gosh, no. Um, it was funny, actually. My, you know, my book, Microservices Patterns, um, you know, that came out in November 2018, which is getting to be a while ago now, yeah. right? Um, I, I mean, I have a lot of ideas, my, a lot of thinking has evolved since the book's come out. Um, I, I don't know if that's ever going to make it into a book. I mean, certainly I'm going to be update. I have a, oh, I know. In, you know, plans to up, create a lot of new content on microservices.io, specif specifically around the area of like, well, when should you use microservices? You know, because as, as I mentioned, that is a, a really key topic. What kinds of criteria should you use to make that decision between monolith and microservices? Yeah. Um, along with some other things like good ways to document a microservice architecture. Um, but, but no immediate plans for a book. It's a lot of work. Chris, thank you so much for your time. Uh, enjoy your stay here in Atlanta. And thank you for watching. For the Oracle Groundbreakers team, I'm Bob Rubart. Stay tuned.